We're running late, and we want more discussion than introduction. So therefore, I'll be very brief. General Powell is the only one who does not need any introduction, because uh, he is Jamaica's gift to this country and City College's gift to our nation. If you can become four-star general, chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of State, and then have still thousands of friends who adore him, <laughs> you can have General Powell. General Powell also has been gracious enough and generous enough to start the school at City College. They called it Harvard of the California, New York. I call it Harvard City College of the Massachusetts. <laughs> because uh, Harvard uh, has inherited all the wealth. City College has earned it, everything. CUNY has earned it, everything. <laughs> so with that, I'll have one more title for adjective to describe General Powell. Is He's a great friend. I also am going to introduce uh, Chancellor Milliken, while well, I'm here to save time, he is the emperor of 550,000 students. <laughs> Unfortunately, he does not use it politically. <laughs> I told him to say, governor, whoever does not do good budgets, to say, on behalf of 550,000 students, their parents, their legislators, and so forth, uh, we would like to thank you for not giving us budget. See how far you can do it. Uh, Gar Millikan is a visionary, and New York needed a visionary now. He's not an administrator alone, but a leader, which is what General Powell has been also leader. Uh, so he's come from Nebraska, uh, tough, visionary, and all tries to put, once again, restore CUNY for what it was, what it is, and what it should be more important. So I'm delighted that he's chosen to come to the state of New York, a city of New York, to add to a lot of great educators of our nation. With that, General Powell. Thank you very much, Vartan. It's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I want to thank Carnegie for its inspiration to pull this together, and all those who are here, especially those who are here from the Lincoln Project, who you'll be hearing from in a moment. And so I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to say a few words. And it'll be a few words because we want to get on with the panel. Many years ago, when I was made a four-star general and announced as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I was the first African-American to hold that position. I was the first ROTC graduate to hold it from a public university. And uh, a lot of other things I was the first at. I was also the youngest. And it was all quite interesting, and it got some attention in the media. One newspaper, the Times of London, the most perhaps preeminent newspaper in the English-speaking world, wrote an article. And the article said, it's a good thing that when Colin Powell's parents left Jamaica, they sailed to Ellis Island and New York rather than Southampton, England. Because if they had gone to Southampton, England, the most they could have dreamed for their son in the military was to become a sergeant in one of the lesser British regiments. Now, I can repeat that story because it isn't mine. It came from the Times of London. And they made such a powerful point. Only in America did two small Jamaican immigrants arrive, one at the Port of Philadelphia, the other one at Ellis Island, coming here for economic opportunity, but that wasn't the only reason they came here. They came here to become citizens of America. That's what makes our immigration such a vital part of our national being, is that people come here to become Americans, and they become some of the best Americans you'll ever know because they know what they have gotten. They know what they have achieved by coming to this great country of ours. But coming here alone wasn't enough. My parents came here and they met each other here and they married here and they had two children. My sister Marilyn who became a teacher and, and me who didn't do as well as the family wanted me to do, I went into the army and it was something of a crisis in the family. I couldn't he get a job? Why is he still in the army? <laughs> um, and that lasted for a long period of time. 
Um, but it wasn't enough just for them to come here and marry and have two children and to work uh, for all the years of their working lives in the garment industry, bringing home 50 to $60 a week. But they took care of two children. And the family also had lots of cousins and aunts and uncles all over the place. So it was a tight-knit family. But even that didn't guarantee the success of their children, either me or my sister Marilyn. What guaranteed the success of their children was the New York City public education system. I'm a public education school kid. I went from kindergarten all the way through college, from PS20 to PS39 to JHS52 to Morris High School to the City College of New York. And it cost my parents nothing, zero, zero. When I was entering college, NYU made an offer to me, but it was $750 a year. Oh my God, uh, unacceptable. I wouldn't put that kind of bill on my parents. And so it was City College of New York. And when I was writing my memoirs some 40 years later, I asked if the Board of Education had all of my records. To my enormous surprise, in this pre-computer age, they had everything. They had every single report card, every single thing I'd ever said about myself was documented by the Board of Education. And I was so surprised, and then I actually saw this guidance counselor statement when I was in junior high school, where I wanted to go to the Bronx High School of Science, and uh, the counselor had written in the note after counseling me, young Powell wants to go to the Bronx High School of Science. We recommend against it. <laughs> and I didn't go to the Bronx High School of Science. <laughs> I went to Morris High School, which is a school where they had to take you in. They had no choice. And I got a great education there. I didn't show it by my grades, but I got a great education there. And I only discovered that later. And then I went to City College of New York for four and a half years, became a geology major, got a BS in geology, and my commission as an Army second lieutenant, and that really became my career path. And I then was thrown into the Army shortly after seg segregation ended in the Army. I was in the first group of officers in an unsegregated Army. And I competed against West Pointers. I competed against uh, Harvard. and I competed against VMI and the Citadel and all these other schools. And to my enormous surprise, I had gotten a better education in the New York City public school system than I had realized. And it was not just an education in geology and the military, but it was another kind of education it was also a cultural education. I learned about music a little bit. I learned about Chauncey's Canterbury Tales and things like that. I learned a lot of things that helped shape me. I got a complete education, all done by this school system in New York. Why, how, how could it be? Do we have the same situation now? And the answer is it goes back to 1847 when the Free Academy of New York was created. And it simply said, give every child the opportunity for an education. Well, who's gonna pay for it? We are. We, the citizens, we, the taxpayers of New York City and New York State are gonna pay for it. Well, why should you? Who are they? They're poor, they're immigrants. We have to because they're our children. We have to because they are our future. We have to, everybody should have the same opportunity. That's why it was called the Free Academy and the first such institution of its kind in the United States of America. So those great leaders who decided that at the time did not know the great institution they were creating. Not just CCNY, but as you'll hear for a moment, CUNY and this great system that the chancellor commands. Well, presides over. <laughs> <laughs> but the point of all this is that the taxpayers of New York knew that they had to invest in their own future. This wasn't charity to immigrants. This wasn't charity to poor people. They were investing in their own future and what a future it became because they knew that unless they paid the price for this education, they would not get the people they needed in the future to be the citizens that would make this the great city that it has become. It still has that lineage. It still has that model but it's becoming more difficult, not only here in New York City and New York State, but throughout the country. We have too many governments at city and state level who think they can shortchange the education system and somehow this was going to help the society. It does not, it hurts the society. We need people who understand in states and cities throughout America that there is no more important function of government other than securing 
the terrain and securing the people than educating the people, educating the future customers, the future workers, the future leaders. That's the most important task of a government. And that is a task that New York has been in the forefront of for hundreds of years now. And so I'm so glad you are all here assembled to listen to this very distinguished panel, Making Americans and Making America. We're immigrants, we're all immigrants. First immigrants came from England. And it's been wave after wave over the last several hundred years. And with every wave, we become a better place. We are enriched with our cultures, with our language, with our music, with our dance, with our intellectual capacity. Um, and we should treasure this immigrant tradition of ours, which is why I'm such a strong supporter of immigration reform. We need it. We need it desperately, and we need it as soon as possible. With that, I'm very delighted to uh, turn it over to the Chancellor and his panel for the rest of the discussion. Chancellor? Thank you. <laughs> so first of all, uh, to my friend Vartan, thank you for hosting today's discussion and for your longstanding leadership in higher education and in the development of great policy for this country. We appreciate your leadership for many, many years. Second to General Powell, thank you. Uh, this is the second time I've been with General Powell today, and like many of you, I would take as many opportunities as I would get. But I appreciate, as always, the support you have given to your alma mater, your time, your treasure, your commitment, your example. Uh, for the people who will, will follow you. So I get to lead uh, this discussion, which means I just get to throw out a few softball questions and these people get to say really insightful things about the issues that uh, uh, confront us today. But I am gonna say a few words about this just to frame um, the discussion. So um, as what General Powell said, when we talk about this country in the abstract and we talk about what American values are and what makes us great, we talk about being a nation of immigrants that welcome generation after generation and enrich this country and with good reason because we look at all the accomplishments in the arts and the science and the military and education. Um, extraordinary advances because of this. We're the melting pot, at least in theory. Um, and I'm gonna quote one line which I love for those people who went by the Statue of Liberty when they came to New York. The Emma Lazarus's line, send these the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So today, it seems like some would replace the golden door with a wall. Uh, that's part of what we're going to discuss today because it raises a series of questions. Does it make us stronger to keep people out or to invite them in? Um, what benefits do they bring and does that outweigh the costs? Uh, does it cost other Americans whose qualifications may be that they're family came to this country a little earlier uh, than others. And finally, one question that we'll hone in on is what's the obligation of the taxpayers with regard to education, and in particular public higher education. This is a time when the number of immigrants in this country is at an all-time high nationally. In New York, 37% of our residents today are foreign born, or three million uh, people. As General Powell said, there is no institution that is more deeply involved and better equipped, I think, to carry out uh, Emma Lazarus's vision than CUNY. For almost 170 years, CUNY's been the ladder to economic success for generation after generation of immigrants. 40% of our 245,000 undergraduates today were born uh, in another country. 40% are the first in their family to attend college. 40% come from a household with an annual income of 20,000 uh, or less. CUNY has embraced immigrants since 1847. Two years ago when I learned that uh, we were not uh, receiving our share of, uh, uh, of new immigrants through Don Graham's The Dream uh, US program, we made it a priority because we welcomed them regardless of their status. And we went from 30 students to 360 in a year that were supported by uh, The Dream US because our government does not uh, support them. So um, this is not about CUNY today. But uh, General Powell told me I needed to brag a really? little bit, so now I'm done with that. I bragged a little. And if he were sitting here, he would say the same thing to me that he said this morning, uh, which I sort of got the impression that he's done a lot of this and had a lot of lieutenants make presentations because about the time I was to be done, he said, thank you, JB. And everybody knew I was done, no matter uh, where we were on the program. So you're welcome, General Powell. 
Um, so what about the immigrants? Do we have an obligation to educate them? Is it in our national interest? Do we believe that Lazarus's words are relevant uh, today? So we have three panelists that are going to uh, address these questions and others. Bob Bergino, the uh, former chancellor of UC Berkeley and the president of the University of Toronto, which I take to mean that he himself is an argument for welcoming talented immigrants right. into this country. <laughs> So for the last few years, Bob has co-chaired the Lincoln <coughs> Project at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which focuses on the role and case for investment in public research universities. Uh, next to Bob is Eileen Truax, a journalist based in Los Angeles with long experience covering Mexican and Mexican-American issues and has written a book on undocumented students in the U.S. And finally, batting cleanup, Vince Boudreau is a political scientist, is dean of the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership at CUNY City College. The premise of today's uh, discussion is essentially this, that immigration and public higher education are in some way linked. And are they? What should they be? What's the connection between these two? Bob, we'll start with you. Right. So, so first of all, I want to know if I get equal time for the University of California. No, when we go to uh, Berkeley, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so uh, I'll, I'll try and say two things very briefly. Of course, they are uh, intimately linked. Uh, when we started to increase, really under my direction, the number of international undergraduate students uh, at the University of California, generally in Berkeley in particular, I sat at a meeting, a regents meeting, where one of the regents started to rail against us and against me in particular for taking away spots from Californians for, for immigrants. Then I looked around the table uh, and then pointed out to uh, this region that five out of the ten chancellors were immigrants uh, who had come from other countries to the United States and were providing leadership uh, for the universities in California. So first of all, immigrants have historically always represented an enormous source of talent for the United States and it's talent that we cannot afford to waste. Second, very quickly, is that uh, some of you may know that uh, I uh, ended up playing a leadership role for, for treating uh, undocumented students in the state of California, treating them in a, in a humane fashion. And so I'm very proud of the fact that Berkeley became the first uh, public university, actually any university in the United States, to offer comprehensive financial aid uh, to undocumented students. And so one consequence of that is that now a significant fraction of our Student, undergraduate student body are actually undocumented uh, immigrants. And this is our obligation as a public institution. I mean, why do we exist other than to educate highly talented, motivated uh, young, young people who, who uh, want to live the American dream? And I think it's a very special obligation that public institutions have. Uh, and I'm proud of the fact that, that uh, uh, we have universities like CUNY, which is truly extraordinary historically in this, and the University of California, which also has historically played a very important role in, in both attracting and educating highly talented immigrants. So if we stipulate that Bob sort of covered the general point about are these topics linked, then I am going to go into a second set of, of questions, if that's okay. So uh, I'll go to Vince uh, next. Um, so one complaint that we hear about, read about, is that immigrants today don't assimilate like those in the past. They, they don't learn to speak English quickly. They don't uh, get involved in the same ways in the past. So the Powell School focuses on teaching the importance of civic engagement and skills. And I'd, I'd like to get your impression from your experience at the Powell School about the, in, the new immigrants today. Yeah, I mean, th there, there's really two parts to that question. One is the assimilation part, and the other is the civic engagement. I, mean, I think one thing that we can't forget is that Ben Franklin talked about Germans the way some people today talk about Mexicans and people from Bangladesh. It's exactly the same rhetoric that these people are unassimilable into what was then America. And I think so whenever we get that charge of you can't become American from where you are, we've got to put it in historic context. And in fact, when you go to a place like the Colin Powell School where you know 20 percent of our students are born in the United States, what the student sees when she comes into a classroom is, you know, the future of America. You know, it, they come often from places where there's one language, one ethnicity, and they come into this place where pluralism is the rule of the game. You sit in a, in a room with ideas from all over the world, and nobody's the odd, per, odd person out because everybody is from everywhere. And there's no powerful, more powerful way to assimilate somebody into American society than to experience that in the classroom. The other thing I want to say about civic engagement, 
you see it kind of across the board with our students, but in particular with immigrants. They come to school not to be certified. They often come to school because they're working on issues that have affected their lives. So students who have been undocumented throw themselves into campaigns to pack, pass the DREAM Act. Students that have had trouble getting health care throw themselves into efforts to try to make sure that other people know about the opportunities that, for instance, DACA students have to have health care. So, so it's, it's, it's built into the kind of hunger uh, to get an education, not just for themselves, but for this country that they're trying to be part of. And I, 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 I think it's, it's absolutely stunning and unmistakable when you see it in the classroom. So Arlene, the students come to, the immigrants come to this country. Um, one way or another, we get them into either Berkeley or CUNY, and they get an education. <laughs> so what we hear next and read about is what happens next. Um, so we've had undocumented students come in, and we provide an opportunity for them to get an education. Can they get a job? What happens to the students once they leave our academies? Many of these students are moving towards areas where we, uh, where we need people and where they need to be certified, medicals, lawyers, law schools. I think CUNY is one case that shows that. And uh, so many of them, as Vince mentioned, are fighting their way to, to be working legally in those areas. Uh, CUNY has the case of Cesar Vargas, who went to law school there and now is fighting uh, to be accepted in the bar. Um, but many others are fighting in other ways. They look for a sponsor, they get into science, they start their own business. Many times they give jobs to other people by starting their own business. And I think at the end of the day, when we think about what's the future for them, and many times we talk about it in uh, money terms, in economic terms, what's going to happen? Are we going to get back what we invested in them? Uh, we can we can miss the most important point, which is that we have already invested in them from K to 12. Many of them came to this country when they were one, two, three years old. And uh, I don't like the word assimilation, but they became part of us. And I had the chance to talk to hundreds of these young people. And when, when I started approaching to the subject, I thought that I was talking about immigrants looking to get a regular immigration status. At this point, I can tell you, this book, the people that I talked to are Americans who are looking for a document who say so. These young people are part of us because we allow them to do that. We open our arms. We had them in elementary school, in middle school. They graduated from high school next to our children, many with them, of, of them with honors. They, many of them paid the way to, to um, higher education before DACA. Bob, the, I want to hear a little bit about the Lincoln Project. Um, and uh, uh, you now are maybe the world's expert on the fiscal uh, constraints facing <laughs> public research universities in this country. So if there are so many constraints, and we know what's happening with the state investment uh, over years, um, what's the case you make for providing resources to educate undocumented students in addition to those Californians who've been there for generations? So, so first of all, I think I, we already heard the case. I think <laughs> that was brilliant, by the way, and Thank I you. couldn't agree more. These are en enormously uh, uh, talented young people whose talent we can't afford to waste. We need to pass the Federal Dream Act. There's, it, it, otherwise, it's extraordinary. Plus, my view is that, that uh, our, how we treat the most disadvantaged people in our society, which includes undocumented immigrants, defines us as a society. I mean, are we a humane society? Are we an open society? Are we committed to to uh, supporting the least advantage in, a, in our society. So I, I view it as a matter of basic values, and I think the public, I mean, all universities should, but most especially public research universities should reflect the values of a society which is open and which is, which is uh, supportive. I'm Thank happy you. later to talk about the Lincoln, other aspects of the Lincoln Project. But. Okay, uh, we, we may come back to that, but you know, I couldn't uh, agree more with the case uh, that Eileen made about the investment we've already made, and we made that decision back in the mid-80s about educating yes. people in our public school systems regardless of status. 
Um, now we've made an investment, and uh, uh, we need to continue that investment. I'm reminded of the um, quip from Derek Bach, if, uh, if you think education's expensive, try ignorance. And it's in yeah. all of our interests yeah. to provide uh, not only individual opportunity, but it com it's a competitive interest of, uh, of, of this country. So, Vince, as the political scientist, I want to come back to you okay. on the point you made about how maybe things aren't really that different, uh, it's just a, uh, the, the identities, the countries have changed uh, from when Ben Franklin was, uh, uh, was active. So if things are not that different today, do you have predictions about uh, uh, when we're going to get past the current uh, debate, the current, it, it seems, intransigent debate between those people who want to see uh, doors open? Uh, and reform that encourages people uh, to come and supports their, their growth here versus those who want to pull up the drawbridge and uh, keep people away. Yeah, I, say, I mean, as a political scientist, the first thing I'll say is we're not very good at predicting things. Um, <laughs> that's an easy out. Now that's <laughs> an easy out. Now I'll give you my answer. I mean, historically in the United States, anyone who's shut out of a system you know, we can talk about African Americans, we can talk about women, we can talk about young people who are younger than 21. You look at the process of enfranchisement from the founding to today, and when a group of people have acquired the political clout and the resources and the networks to make their exclusion from the political system hurt the excluders, somebody finds a way to let them in. And sometimes they find a way to let them in in the context of political competition, so one or another party will lead the way because they have a, a kind of a, a reasonable expectation that new voters would be, would be brought in to, uh, and, and, and support them. But you know, we're, we're the, the, the national surveys of the last, last couple of rounds are, talk about the explosion of Latin American Latino voters in, in the United States. And you look at, you, know, you, you look at what's happening in, in Texas, for instance, and, and in, by uh, 2030, there's going to be uh, enough Latino voters in that, in that um, state, maybe to challenge what has been a Republican consensus there. And, and all across the country, you, you, you see this. So I, I think one of the ways that this debate gets solved, at least for now, is by doing exactly the kind of work that we're trying to do on these campuses. Educate people, um, bring them into the, to the civic community, um, mobilize people who aren't voting, make sure that everybody knows that America is all of them, um, and, and, and see what happens. Eileen, are we making progress? Uh, are, are, we, are we convincing people, or are we making the case that Bob did to the Board of Regents about the importance of welcoming and educating and providing opportunity to immigrants? Uh, do you see progress being made? I think we are making progress despite all. Uh, actually, I think when we have these uh, very aggressive reactions like those ideas of building a wall, it's because we are moving forward. So you mm. have a natural response on that. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, when I started working about dreamers and documented students looking for the passing of the Dream Act, uh, it was around 2009. And the subject was not out there much. Uh, you said dreamer and many people didn't know about it and it has not been a decade and most of the people knows about it because they have been uh, very well organized they became political they put their stories out there media are covering so we are more aware of that and that has uh, consequences uh, two examples you have Loera Prieli who is a, a dreamer and a undocumented uh, graduate who is working as a Latino outreach officer in the Hillary Clinton campaign. And you have Eric Andiola and you have Cesar Vargas, who are part of the staff of the Bernie Sanders campaign, also in Latino outreach and communications. Maybe 10 years ago, we would have these stories uh, next to the, the candidate in a public event, just showing this nice story to people and getting an applause. Now, now they are working in their campaigns. They are creating strategies so they can uh, put these issues out there in the political agenda. And to me, that's some kind of progress. People are aware, and they are becoming public, and they are unapologetic, and they are very proud of what they have done, and they should, because when you got to that point, despite all of those obstacles, you are certainly the best one. 
And if someone willing to get to the presidency wants them close, it's for a reason. Yes, Bob. I have a slightly less optimistic view. I, I agree with everything you said, but never, never, and I have to apologize and say I'm a physicist, not a political scientist or a social scientist, so I have a sort of you know, hardcore analytic uh, approach to things. Uh, I would say a couple of reservations that I, that, I, that I have about the, or worries I have about the optimistic mm -hmm. scenario are, so in, in fact, uh, this is not a competition, but I wrote an op-ed in the LA Times in 2007 before anybody had heard about undocumented immigrants talking about this extraordinary group of people and that you know, we needed to figure out how to access mm -hmm. their talent. Uh, okay, if you're Chancellor Berkeley, uh, you're, you get used to the fact that not everybody loves you and they will sometimes on blogs inform you of that in an unkind way. Uh, but this was a new level of hate mail that I got after this 2007. Mm -hmm. And the kind of anger in people, many of them working class people, that we see supporting one of the Republican, now the only Republican candidate, right, uh, was reflected explicitly in this countless number of, of uh, blogs and emails that, that I, I got where, where basically these people whose overall frustration with their lives ended up focusing for reasons I was not able to understand and undocumented immigrants. I had a conversation with Diane Feinstein at that time because I was trying to get her behind this. Uh, and then she commented also just on the level of hate mail uh, that she was getting. And she said at that time, basically no politician would come out in favor of it because, mm -hmm. you know, because it was too dangerous. So that's number one. Number two, we have a strategic problem, which is a partly a problem in my opinion, but um, the community largely disagrees with me, with the undocumented immigrant community itself. Uh, be, because a significant, for, uh, certainly for our students at Berkeley, but broader, at least I only know the California context, uh, undocumented students have decided it's all or nothing because their view is that the DREAM Act criminalizes their parents, which is in some ways true, the mm -hmm. kinds of arguments that people yeah. make. And so then they, their, their argument is, no, we don't support the DREAM Act, actually, mm -hmm. even though they would directly benefit because we do, either you bring our parents along or you don't. My, my personal view, but this is as a, you know, outsider to politics is that the possi I, I think there's a real possibility of passing the DREAM Act and I've been in conversation with a number of Republican, Republican leaders lately uh, who support the DREAM Act but absolutely do not support comprehensive immigration and so and I'd be interested in your responses on that so I'm very worried that by the focus on comprehensive immigration reform that trying to solve the whole problem at once means we're not going to solve anything and that instead my own view is that we need to proceed iteratively. Let's first solve the DREAM Act problems, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You want to jump in on that, Eileen? Or Vince, either one? Uh I would, I, would like, I would like to say, no, yes, I, I totally agree. I mean, uh, I was uh, thinking about the progress that uh, our undocumented uh, youth has done towards moving forward, yeah. uh, putting themselves out there. But uh, I totally agree with you, yeah. and even more. Uh, I think at this moment, because, you know, at this moment, if you think about the whole undocumented population, what uh, the undocumented students have done, it's, um, it's something extraordinary. They're the only group that are protected from deportation at this moment because of the executive action known as DAPA. So uh, they are temporarily protected. And we know that is now uh, been discussed in the Supreme Court, but uh, that's, that's a step forward, but also that creates a problem because there's a feeling sometimes that if uh, DAPA keeps going and they are allowed to, to keep that protection, the problem is solved. And we are far, far from that. Yeah. This is not even a legislation. This is an executive order that can be reversed by the next president or even this one. And uh, the most important thing, it doesn't give a permanent residency or a path to citizenship. This is only a social security number for certain time that can be revoked yeah. and then lives are in a limbo again. So uh, there's much to discuss. As, uh, of course, we have to think about it. And if you talk to a DACA um, student, 
they feel really grateful because now they can walk the streets safely, they can go to school, they're getting jobs, and they're super excited. But um, when, when they started receiving their documents, I, I have many of them in Facebook because I wrote this book and I had to get into Facebook. And it was noisy, but that was the way to approach them. And one of them shared a status when he received his social security number. And he was so excited and he was like, this is the piece of paper that I've missed all my life and I'm so excited and so thrilled, but it feels like being in a rainstorm and being the only one in my family with an umbrella. It was yeah. so touching and that's so true. You cannot have uh, anything fair for these young people if you allow them to work, if you allow them to go to school, if they have to fear that every night when they come back home, one of their parents can be the poor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. I mean, I guess the one thing I would, I, 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 I loved what Eileen said earlier, that, that in some sense the level of vitriol around this debate is, is at least some evidence that progress is being made and there's a reaction to it. The other thing I would say is, is, is that we want to look at the whole constellation of people that are moving the DREAM Act forward. It includes activists and, and their agenda. It also includes people who are trying to make America make more sense. And, you know, if you think about conservative right. America, which is where traditionally a lot of the resistance to immigration reform has come from, it, it's, it's quite divided on the question of yeah. immigration right. between people who, as businessmen, want to secure labor yeah. supply. It's expensive to have um, un, you know, all, all the, the costs associated with, with, with um, uh, undocumented workers. So, so there are, I think we can look to the movement for, for pressure, but we also need to look at what I think is a very dynamic political situation in terms of where, particularly after this election, the status of immigration is going to be among policymakers and among our business community. I, th I think that's a, it's an important thing to keep an eye on. Yeah. So it, it, it seems to me that there's a, a couple of ways that this is approached in the, in, in the political environment. One is that there's a pie and we're dividing up the pie. And the other is that we may grow the pie. Yeah. At a time that we know that by, what, 2020, 65 percent of all jobs are going to require education uh, beyond high school. Yeah. And we have a goal for America to be the most educated country again in the world, the highest levels of education attainment by 2020. Why isn't this part of the argument that if we can welcome the best talent, if we can educate them and continue to do what we've done for a couple of hundred years, which is to uh, draw many talented, energetic, ambitious people to this country to be successful, why isn't that a part of everybody's vision of what a great economic power this country can be? Take a stab I'm at it. I'm waiting maybe. for a hand. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, somewhere along the line, we got comfortable talking about our social policies in terms of individual entitlements. And, and you know, we, we, we talked about individual welfare queens in a story that wasn't even really an accurate depiction of, of the person involved. We talked about education going to individual students rather than constructing a society yeah. that, 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 that matters. You know, the, the projections of what you would get if you, you regularize the immigration status of, of, of just the students who are undocumented is something like four billion dollars over the course of their life but that's complicated. That's a kind of a, a statistical projection. It's much easier to tell a story of somebody who you can depict as unworthy of society's largesse. The, 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 the story that we used to, I don't say we used to, and we, we, we still have, we still know this story, we still tell it to one another, but the story of a society getting together and, 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 and investing in a totality rather than individuals and assessing the output of that investment rather than the story of one individual's life. It, it, it's, 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 harder to, to, it's harder to tell, it's harder to understand, it demands patience, and it demands a kind of statistical understanding of outcomes rather than a mere kind of biographical depiction of something that's gone well or something that's gone wrong. I think we have to work on that. This sounds like a great assignment for the Colin Powell School. It's fantastic uh, yeah. assignment. Right. This is a perfect example of civic engagement yeah. uh, in action. You know, at lunch I was having a conversation about the, the, the need for us to do a much better job of publicizing 
marketing, if you will, those role models mm -hmm. that people can look to yeah. as successes yeah. so that we encourage more. And, and I'm veering off of just uh, immigrants here, but underrepresented populations yeah. in our yeah. colleges and universities and going to the job market in the, in the hottest fields. And we, we may not have done uh, the best job uh, of that. So is, is that part of what we need to do? Is that part of the political case to demonstrate what the success I think uh, we, when we talk about immigration, we normally uh, talk about it from a political perspective and an economical perspective. And especially when we have uh, elections coming, immigration is there. But we, we have to start looking at it as a human rights issue and as a social justice issue. And if you approach the subject that way, you're going to have to pass the numbers and the facts and start uh, putting names and faces to the cases. And once you start understanding why a student who goes to the school, after that goes to work in a fast food restaurant, and after that hits home and helps uh, the family to do something else, and then uh, in the weekend maybe see a friend. I just described the regular life of one of our young people. But for an undocumented person, every one of those actions means something. They have to decide, are they willing to drive or not if they don't have a driver's license? Are they having money to go to the school or not? Maybe that's why they need to work in a fast food change, but they don't have a social security number. How are they working? Maybe when they get home, they're really tired, but the family needs help. And if they want to go out during the weekend, if, let's say, it's a young man dating someone, maybe he has to ask his younger brother to drive him there because he has no driver's license. Every decision they make has something to do with the fact that they are undocumented. And sometimes they don't even remember how they get to the country. So these are daily challenges that they are conquering. And we are not aware that people sitting in Washington, D.C., making laws sometimes don't take the time to talk to them, to spend a day with them, to walk a little bit in their shoes. I know this can sound very <laughs> common, but we really need to do that because we need to put names and faces. We're not talking about numbers. This is us. It's the people that is living around us, and we're affecting their lives. We just did a report on the uh, success of the last group uh, the last cohort coming through of 350 these undocumented students who are able to attend because of private support. Their retention rate is the same as our honors program mm -hmm. and their GPA well above the, the population at large at CUNY. So, uh, you know, when you see the kind of evidence that, 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 that people will take advantage of the opportunity provided in yes. such uh, a strong way, it, it makes just a compelling case, uh, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Bob. So, uh, going back to your original question, which went beyond uh, undocumented students, so just generally, manifestly, uh, one of the most important social issues facing the United States is the growing gap between the advantaged and, and the disadvantaged. Uh, and that's playing out in this election in a really dramatic way, actually, with the different candidates. Um, and everyone agrees, not everyone, but I think the vast majority of people agree that education is the single most effective mechanism for addressing income inequality. And I think it's true we have not told our story well. So that's your original question. So can we do better in telling our story, uh, whether it's anecdotes with individual people or, or more generally figuring out a way of educating the public as a whole of the role of education in, in leveling the playing field and, and in trying to bring the United States back to a, more ec to a society where where resources are distributed more equitably. And I think that's a very special role that education generally plays, and public universities like CUNY in particular play a, a special role. Mm -hmm. So in a few minutes, we're going to see if there are questions uh, in the audience. But before we do that, uh, Bob, I want to come back. We talked um, on the first question I asked you about the Lincoln Project. And I think I'd like the uh, group to hear just a couple of minutes about it, because I think it, it, it helps, it informs some of this discussion that we're having, but it, 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 it even goes more broadly. Um, but it gets at the point that, that, that General Powell made about um, how it, what our obligations are um, to the next generation of students, 70% of our students educated in public universities in this country. Um, so what did you learn right. through the so, work with the Lincoln So Project? just, you know, this, of course, we have 
you know, more than 100 pages of text, which I'll try and summarize, summarize in two minutes. So, and I just would encourage actually all of you to go to the American Academy website slash Lincoln Project and look at the five documents we've produced, most especially the, uh, the one with the recommendations. Uh, so th this project got initiated uh, at a dinner in California, actually, with the president of the American Academy, myself, and, uh, and Don Graham's cousin, Bob Haas, who's been, you know, has used his family's resources and his own in an extraordinarily supportive way, including for undocumented students. And we were talking about disinvestment in higher education in California. Uh, and then, but of course, we're fully aware that this is hardly unique to the state of California. So we decided through the American Academy to take a look at the issues nationally. And just to say very briefly, and some people don't like this message, but for better or for worse, uh, uh, disinvestment by state governments is a national phenomenon and it's irreversible. And so people who think if we just, you did a better job uh, up in Albany or we did a better job in Sacramento and politicians, state politicians would understand and they'd start pouring money back on, uh, to us. That's not going to happen and we have to deal with that as a, as a reality. And it's not going to happen because of the, first of all, K through 12 has done a better job than we have, than higher education. Uh, secondly, Medicaid is an irreversible force that's, that's uh, progressively increasing pressure on state budgets. Uh, and, and thirdly, uh, uh, it turns out that now California just became the 12th state in, in the union that spends more money putting people in prison than giving them a university education. And this is also irreversible. We're adding state by state as we incarcerate more and more people. Uh, funding for for uh, uh, public education, is, when you go through the ups and downs, has been approximately flat across the country. And funding for incarceration has, since the 1980s, has gone up by 165%. This, this, is, this, is, a na this is a national shame that this is true in the United States. That's also irreversible. So because of all these forces, then we need to have a, a model for the support of public higher education that's much broader. Some of it is on the backs of students with increased tuitions. We need federal government to begin to play a more active role than they have in the past. And we need corporations to step up. Uh, you know, the US corporations are currently holding $2.4 trillion offshore because of their unwillingness to pay taxes on them. If 1% of that 2.4 million was devoted to public higher education, then it would enable us to address significantly the problems that, that we face. So we in the Lincoln Project, this and many other ideas talk about, we call it the new compact, that we need a new compact for the support of public higher education in the United States. Uh, everybody has to participate, the universities, the students, corporations, foundations, uh, like this one, uh, 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 private philanthropists, uh, et cetera. Uh, and and uh, how we manage that, of course, is, is one of the challenges, but that's the direction, in our opinion, that we need to go. I obviously agree with you, uh, everything that uh, you said. It seems to me that we're a little slow in this country to, um, uh, to sort of catch up and that we've still got school calendars based on agrarian calendars. And, and, and now we've got a non-discretionary versus discretionary schism between uh, K-12 and higher education that's based on, a, on an early 20th century model about how the high school diploma was the key to uh, being productive in society. Right. Right. Now we know that the vast majority of jobs will require right. college education. So we need to rethink, I think, that a little bit. Uh, and maybe we can become, uh, both right. in Sacramento and Albany, a little right. more successful. But you're absolutely right, we're not going to change going to history. Change it's been working and, this and, way since the mid-80s. And this is more dramatic in southern states, by the way. So this exact issue that you stated, whereas uh, uh, in, in, in Tennessee, which we visited recently, you could get a job in an automobile factory uh, with a high school education. You could have a really quite nice middle class life. Now those bolts are tightened by a robot, right? And so. So production lines that had 100 employees now have six, right? And so these people are graduating from, come from traditions of families where a high school education was adequate, and then suddenly it isn't. Uh, and the governor of Tennessee pointed out to me that there's, if you look at the support of Donald Trump county by county in the state of Tennessee, it correlates explicitly with educational level and lost jobs, one to one across the state. Yeah. All right, we're going to see if there are questions uh, in the audience that people have been waiting to ask. City College student, Colton Powell School. Uh, I'm a second generation American. Uh, my father came here from Pakistan, had a food truck before it was popular. 
Um, <laughs> and he, he made his way in America. And at one point, when he came here up until the 80s, it was giving your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. And now it's become they took our jobs. And I've been upstate to uh, Somos. I've been upstate in Albany to the Black and Latino caucuses. And they talk about pushing the DREAM Act and making a strong political stand as a conglomerate of black and Latinos. However, the popular dialogue with the majority, especially in places like Albany, don't see us as people trying to become Americans, to assimilate, to meld, whatever you want to call it, but they see us as an invading force. How do we change that dialogue of we're not here to supplant you, we're here to grow with you? It's, it's tricky because we're, we're looking at a generation of, of people who for the first time are maybe not doing as well as, as, as their parents. And that's a, that's a kind of a new narrative for the United States. And, and so people in those sorts of circumstances look for scapegoats. I, I periodically give lectures at retirement communities and I had lunch with a couple of City College graduates who all over lunch were talking about their two kids who were lazy and unemployable and what am I going to do with these kids? They didn't learn anything in school. And then I went to a forum on immigration when I talked and they asked the first question. And it was about um, people from the Philippines and Mexico taking jobs at their kids. They just told me that their kids weren't, weren't right? So you, so you have this really easy narrative of, you know, you, uh, of if things aren't going well for me, it's got to be somebody else's fault. And that's a, that's a, that's a world historical human phenomenon. So, what, so what's the answer? The answer is most first generation immigrants aren't, aren't taking jobs. They're entrepreneurs, yes. right? Your, 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 your father didn't take a job from anybody. He, didn't, he wasn't drawing a salary that someone else was going to apply for. And, and, and making that clear, that first generation Americans typically build businesses that employ other uh, Americans is huge. The second thing is kind of what I was saying earlier, is, is that any way you slice it economically, incorporating new Americans into our economy, into our educational system, is a net gain. It's a net gain for us socially, it's a net gain for us politically, and it's a gain for us economically. And we just have to get better at telling that story. Thank you. Let's go over here. And my question has to go to licensure. So to what extent are the leaders of public universities also playing a role in using their really good will and political capital to ensure that licensure is also opened up to people, regardless of their immigration status or undocumented status. I would urge you to consider that if you haven't done it already, because the fact is they will leave your universities with degrees, but are oftentimes are stopped yeah. from obtaining the actual license that they can, will help them with their own entrepreneurial spirits. So I think it's an important issue. I would have to say that uh, certainly during my time as chancellor, which ended three years ago, uh, we put so much focus on uh, students themselves, and DACA just appeared in the end. But this is then, you know, this is, uh, as, as you following what you were saying, right, given a success, this is now, because of those successes, this is now a new issue that's opened up, and it's obviously one we have, need to pay attention to. Could and should service in the military be scale upable for a path to citizenship? We could ask General Powell, he's probably the best one to answer that, but certainly from my point of view, absolutely yes, and I suspect. No. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, the answer is yes, we'll move on. So, Alan, go ahead. Right. I'm Don Graham, I'm, from, I'm a businessman from Washington, and I'm the co-founder of something called the Dream.us, which is a, scholar fund, a scholarship fund for undocumented students. Our organization has raised money for scholarships for dreamers to places like CUNY. We're partners with 70 colleges around the country, all of which have the relatively low tuition price points that CUNY offers. This is the most motivated group of students in the United States, the most discriminated against and the most motivated. The level of motivation is absolutely extraordinary. But the second thing I want to say to all you New Yorkers is I hope you know how lucky you are to have CUNY. Uh, there are large metropolitan areas in the United States that have no such place. In Chicago, we cannot find an institution for uh, our scholarships uh, that is affordable in the way CUNY is or in the way that Miami-Dade College in mm -hmm. Florida is or in the way the Cal States are or the way the lower-end University of Texas campuses are. 
this institution still works the kind of miracles General Powell so eloquently described. And the student participants at your table will describe similar miracles, but you also need to know how hard it is for them. If you have money to spare for $25,000, you can see one of these students through to graduation. And I promise you that if you back one of these students, they will graduate and they will become a highly productive contributor to this country, as will Jason, the young man sitting next to me, who is a 4.0 student at the Colin Powell School. You know, I, I've never been in a gathering where Don hasn't passed the hat, so thank you for doing that because it'll support some CUNY students and some California students. So, Jason. So, uh, as Eileen uh, talked about earlier, she described the process of going home from school and then helping out your parents and then going to bed late at night and then doing the same thing over and over again. I, I thought that she was describing me personally as I did that last semester. My dad used to work, well, he still works at constru uh, as a construction worker. He had a fifth grade education level and my mom only went to college, but she's unemployed right now. And my dad only works for $45 a day. And the fact that he knew how hard that he has to work for that $45, he made sure to send me to college last semester. We paid out of pocket, found a way somehow, and I excelled. I was able to get a 4.0 last semester. Yes. And Honestly, it's, it's one thing to talk about DACA students, but it's another thing to hear from them, from them first, first point, first person, sorry. And I truly, truly appreciate everything that you guys are advocating for. It, it definitely means so much to me, seriously. Thank Good. you. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to mention that uh, long, not long ago, we went to pay homage to President Lincoln in Washington. We lay a wreath at Lincoln Memorial, thanking him for his vision for, uh, in 1862, in the middle of Civil War, to create public university system and also to launch National Academy of Sciences and many other projects, which allowed America to be ready for scientific uh, industrial revolution. During these presidential debates for last year, not once education has been discussed. K-12 right. right. education, with the exception of mentioning Common Core, not once higher education has been discussed except how much it costs. Right, correct. Uh, today we right. learned in the morning of the Board of Visitors meeting that 70% of CUNY students go attend without paying tuition. That has never been advertised in many ways. So I hope the time has come for us once again, and that's what this meeting is about, to put education and immigration on nation's agenda. So during general election, candidates will be forced to discuss where they stand about future of America, where does spend higher education. And I'd say not a cost, but an investment. They're investing in our nation's future. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. Thank, Thank you, Bob. Thank you, all of you. Thank, Thank you, Martin. Martin.